Let's open our Bible to 1 Peter chapter 5. As you're turning there, we're looking again at the man behind the message, Peter, the man whose words are recorded by Mark as he wrote the gospel by Mark. And uh, it was Peter's experiences captured and written down by Mark. And we've been looking at Peter and just uh, introducing his life. And we're going to be in 1 Peter 5 momentarily. I want you to think about Peter in maybe a different light. I want you to think about him like uh, most of the world thinks about him today, most of Christendom at least, because as humans, most of us have someone in our lives that we look to as a hero, someone who has perhaps mastered something that we want to master, or they have accomplished something we want to accomplish, or they are something we wish to be, and so we look up to them and, and emulate them. People need heroes, examples that they follow, that inspire them. And of course, in our world, there are sports heroes like golfing heroes who inspire. There are uh, basketball and football heroes who inspire. There are entertainers and authors who become heroes and inspire people. There are political, civic, uh, all kinds of different individuals that inspire us. Um, I always think it's almost impossible to see that picture of uh, 911 with those firemen in the wreckage lifting that flag. Uh, it, it's almost become a second uh, Iwo Jima uh, symbol in America's uh, life, and it almost always just kind of miss everyone's eyes because we are all either consciously or unconsciously moved by people we admire. And then above all these that I've mentioned, there are religious leaders who literally inspire millions. Now, I'm not saying positively or negatively, because a lot of them are uh, perhaps not truthful to God's word or, or perhaps aren't even involved with God's word, but they are religious. But if you've ever picked up the Bible and looked at it, there are a lot of people that could be heroes, and I'd like to present one this morning. In fact, if you've never thought about having a character in the Bible as someone that you look to for inspiration as they followed Christ, you want to then I'd like to suggest Peter. Let me share why. Because Peter is the person in the Bible that, that truly is a hero to me because of the way his life played out. And let me share you. Number one, if you ever want to be bold, you know, people struggle with that. If, if I said, okay, we're going to cancel the service, we're all going to walk around and pass out tracks for the next hour, Two-thirds of you would suddenly be coughing and blowing your nose and running to the bathroom. You know what I mean? You wouldn't want to do that because people don't like that. They don't, it's, it's kind of uh, uh, scary to do confrontational evangelism. Well, Peter was bold. He was a model of boldness. Uh, in fact, he was so bold at Caesarea Philippi, he boldly toward, told the Lord Jesus that he, the Lord of heaven, was incorrect. Now, that's really bold. I mean, he could tell Jesus, uh, you know, what he shouldn't. That's boldness. If you ever want to be fearless, Peter was a model of fearlessness. At Gethsemane, which we'll look at again tonight, he single-handedly, don't, don't think Peter denied Christ because he was afraid. He wasn't afraid. He was unprepared. He was not afraid because he had his little sword at Gethsemane facing 600 Roman soldiers. And he pulled out that sword and he started. I mean, he was going to, he was just going to have his own little bighorn, you know. He was going to do his last stand. He was going to take him on himself. And he was unafraid of a whole army. So he was fearless. And that's, that's fearlessness. If you ever think of being a leader, Peter is a model of leadership. From the first day Jesus called him on the shore of Galilee, I imagine it was only moments later that he took over. <laughs> He was the leader of the twelve. Always was. Front of top of every list, uh, front of every conversation. He was the leader. He just was a tremendous commander in chief leader. And he remained so throughout Christ's ministry. And that's leadership. If you ever want to be forgiven, Peter is a model of forgiveness. The moment he looked up and saw Jesus Christ at Galicantu, at that instant when his eyes met Christ, and his sorrowing heart grieved for his sin. He experienced the awareness that Christ was forgiving him. Now Jesus restored him later, but he knew, he knew as he looked in the eyes of Jesus, after all his denials, after he wept bitterly, after he cried out in his heart for forgiveness, Jesus looked at him in love and forgave him that dark night. Peter is a model of forgiveness. He knows what it's like to know, though I've failed, 
yet he's forgiven me. If you ever want to be restored, Peter is a model of restoration to ministry. At the Sea of Galilee, when Jesus stood on the shore and clearly, completely, tenderly forgave him of all of his denials. That's a model of restoration. That Jesus said, I forgive you, I reintroduce you, I redeploy you into ministry, you are forgiven. What a model. If you ever want to be greatly used, Peter's a model of incredible success. He stood almost alone before his entire world on the 50th day after the crucifixion, after the cross. And Peter turns the tide of the whole world to God's way. Peter single-handedly with only the help of the Holy Spirit, which he learned to depend on, single-handedly started the greatest movement the world has ever seen. His message of calling individuals to conversion in Christ is now the most repeated message for the longest period of time in the history of this planet. Peter founded upon Jesus Christ what we know today as the church of Jesus Christ. Now that's success. He did it. In the Spirit's power, but he was the visible instrument that introduced, as we saw last week, the gospel to the Jews, the gospel to the Samaritans, and then the gospel to the whole world, to us who are Gentiles. And if you ever want to be humble, that's what First Peter chapter 5, we read this morning, is all about. Peter is a model of humility. Despite the incredible achievements, he walked with Jesus for over three years right at his side. I mean, he was associated with Christ. Then he went to Pentecost and beyond. And Peter, talk about humility, he walked away from the greatest miracle. 3,000 people, formerly cheering for Christ's crucifixion, and remarkably cut to the heart by the Holy Spirit and through his ministry, converted to Jesus Christ. And Peter walked away from that the same as he walked in. He didn't get the big head. He didn't think that he was the walking instrument of God, that, you know, uh, God can't make it without me. And he took the gospel from Pentecost to Cornelius. He started the Gentile church, which we're all a part of. And he walked from that event away just as a servant of the Lord that God chose to use, never thinking of himself more highly than he ought to think. And that's the way that Peter humbly stayed to the last recorded words of his life. That's humility. Peter is a hero. In fact, he's actually above that. He's a superhero to millions around the world this day. But Peter, when found by Jesus, had every mark of becoming a bully. Have you ever thought about what Peter was like? He was kind of uh, uh, the, the kind of guy that was brash and direct and hard to intimidate. He was probably strong and big. I mean, anybody that can pull in a full fishing net that's bursting single-handedly through the water. I mean, I can just see him uh, without the aid of all these new machines that people use. I mean, he just had strength the old-fashioned way by work. So he was this big, strong, powerful guy. And he was also quite good at what he did. He was good at fishing. He was good at talking. He was a natural leader. He drew people's loyalties. He he was also, though, selfish, self-centered. In fact, he confessed that he was unclean-lipped. So that means he had a dirty mouth of some form or other. And that's what he said. He said, I'm an unclean uh, person, Lord. He says, depart from my presence. And that speaks of someone that's defiled or dirty, maybe through their talk. But all that together makes for a bully. Anybody who's got a strong personality, quick talking, big, strong uh, body, and, and a born, pushy leader could be a bully and get his way and would be awful to have in power over you. But look how Peter turned out. When he met Jesus, Jesus changed him. And from the moment that Jesus met him and changed him, whenever Peter acknowledged Christ's presence, he was different. Now, a few times in his weakness, like we saw at Galicantu, when he wasn't looking at Christ, when he was operating his own, he went back to the old Peter. Remember the cursing came out that night? Do you remember the, the kind of pushiness he was with the disciples? He, he was trying to, to get something. That was his old life coming back. Maybe that's an encouragement, too, that he wasn't perfect. But Peter was given awesome responsibilities. And right here in 1 Peter 5, after he becomes one of the greatest figures in the history of the church, what does he say of himself? 
Verse 1, I, Peter, am a fellow elder. I am just a, a servant of Christ, a fellow shepherd with you. I, with you, in verse 5 and 6, submit and humble myself. You see, Peter was a model. All that strong personality added to it, big influence and power make for a dangerous combination. It's good that Peter didn't want to be anything but Christ's servant. And Peter is really one of the greatest examples of humility in God's word. Because he gave up so much potential power and prestige for so much pain, he goes from here to his second epistle into obscurity and martyrdom. And never let himself become anything that was great. He just had a life of pain and suffering as Christ's servant. And so that's why there in his testimony in 1 Peter 5, he said, I'm just like you. And what a model he is. Well, a lot's happened since then. Today, the largest church building in the world, owned by the largest representation of Christendom, is called St. Peter's. In fact, if you ever go there, they have in the floor... The outlines inside of St. Peter's of all the other great cathedrals of the world showing that all of them could fit inside of St. Peter's because it's the biggest. Think about today, there in the church that has the largest church building has a man called the Pope. And he is a man who claims to be a direct successor of a long line of vicars of Christ, of which they say the first pope and the first vicar was the man who wrote First Peter and Second Peter, and whose experiences are the gospel by Mark. It's interesting to think about that, because did a man who is one of my and maybe your greatest earthly heroes, did he really start that monolithic, as it's theologically called, monarchical episcopate, the Roman Catholic Church. Did Peter really start that? I'd like you to do something with me. Because to find out whether Peter really was the first pope, I've brought a special expert witness. The only human being that could ever testify as to whether Peter founded what we call the Roman Catholic Church. And you know who that is? Peter himself. And we can interview him, and we're going to start in the book of Acts in just a moment, and we're going to go through, uh, and you can start turning to Acts chapter 2 with me, and we're going to interview Peter himself. And by way of an absolutely perfect transcript of what Peter himself actually said. And as you turn to Acts chapter 2, I want you to know that you have the most perfect transcript of conversations that took place nearly 2,000 years ago. And they have not deteriorated. They haven't had data loss. They haven't been uh, erased or, or crashed. We have a flawless copy of what Peter said. And as we listen to that copy, which is recorded in this Bible, God's Word, and as we interview St. Peter... You in your own heart, as you read these verses and mark them, can decide whether or not Peter founded what we see today as the largest representation of Christianity in the world. And give us maybe a biblical perspective on how to look on that institution. Well, what do you think, Peter? In uh, Let's get to Acts 2, and we're going to be in verse 21 of Acts 2. His replies, by the way, I'm going to be reading, it won't quite match your Bible because the verses I'm reading are from the Confraternity text. That's a Roman Catholic Bible with the official imprimatur of the bishops and the cardinals. Okay, so this is, but you'll find it says the same thing as yours. It's just a little different uh, uh, gloss on the language. But um, I'm going to ask Peter a series of questions, and you follow along from your Bible, and you look in Acts 2.21. Peter, number one, as a fisherman, talk to normal people like us. Can you explain how normal people, fishermen, people like just common, ordinary people like us, how we can be saved and get to heaven? Verse 21 of Acts 2. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Wow, that's pretty simple, Peter. So we don't need a church in between? We don't need individuals? We don't need a hierarchy? We don't need a layer? No, no, no. Look at chapter 10. He says it again of Acts in verse 43. In fact, he says it all the time. To him, Acts 10, 43, 
All the prophets bear witness that through His name, all who believe in Him may receive forgiveness of sin. So, so Peter, just so I don't miss it, for normal people like us, how do we get to heaven? Verse 43 of chapter 10. Through His name, all who believe in Him may receive forgiveness of sins. That is simple. Okay, Peter, let's go on and turn back to chapter 4 of Acts. Let's introduce uh, another idea. Let's ask him another question. Peter, please explain to me who mediates my needs to God. Do I need someone to help me get saved? And are there many ways to God? And do I need someone to explain to me which way is right and all that? Uh, Peter, could you just give us a word on that? Chapter 4 of Acts, verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And that's the name of Jesus. So I don't need anyone but Jesus. No church, no messenger, no no intermediary, no anything, no layers. Just direct. There's no other name that's been given. But that name, which is the name of Jesus. Okay, Peter, let's turn over to chapter 8. You're talking again. And look at verse 22. How do we address our prayers, Peter? Now, should we pray to you? Should we pray to the Lord's mother? Would that be helpful? Should we talk to, pray to one of the great apostles or prophets or maybe some great saint? How do we pray? Acts 8, verse 22. At a very climactic moment, look at these words of Peter. And he says in the middle of the verse, pray to God. How do you like that? Would have been a great time to introduce another way to pray, wouldn't it? But he says, pray to God. In fact, he's still saying the same thing at the end of his life. Look at 1 Peter. If you want to keep your marker there, we're going to go back and forth to 1 Peter because this is at the tail end of his life. 1 Peter 1.17. Look, look how he says it at the end of his life, the same thing he says in Acts 8. 1 Peter 1.17 and Again, reading from the confraternity text, this is how it's worded, 1 Peter 1.17. Invoke the Father, him who without respect of persons judges according to each one's word. Who do you pray to? Invoke the Father. As as he said in Acts 8.22, pray to God. Don't pray to to Saint so-and-so or Mother so-and-so or Saint Peter or one of his... Pray to God. That's what this great superhero of saint said. Well, back to Acts chapter 8, where you were, but don't lose First Peter. We'll go back there. Peter, I wonder, can I buy God's grace in any way? Uh, can I buy God's grace for myself, for someone I love, for anybody else? Is there any way through the church or through others or through what they've done, something I can do that I can buy this? What do you have to say about that? Look at verse 20 of Acts 8. Peter was to the point, Acts 8, 20. Thy money go to destruction with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. Hmm. Thou hast no part or lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this weakness, and pray to God, as we just saw. Perhaps this thought of thy heart may be forgiven thee. Absolutely no financial means of obtaining grace. In fact, at the end of his life, what did Peter say? We all know this verse. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, money, but with the precious blood of Christ, Peter said it. There's no payment that we can pay. No possible way of getting grace in any other way than by faith in the finished work of Christ. Well, as you're turning to Acts 15, verse 10, 15.10 in the book of Acts. Let's ask Peter another question. What about traditions and laws that seem to just keep growing over time? How many traditions do you expect us to keep as believers, Peter? Uh, Because as time goes by, traditions kind of mount up. And just what about the tradition thing, Peter? Well, Acts 15, verse 10 and 11, Peter, the leader, clearly addresses that. 
he says in verse 10, Why then do you now try to test God by putting on the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers uh, have been able to, to bear? But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. You know what he's talking about? Trying to impose the old customs of the Jewish faith on the new church in Christ. He says, no, don't do that. And if Peter said, no, don't do that, then he says, no, don't do all the other stuff that's crept in over the centuries. Peter, do you want us to follow tradition? No, don't put God to the test. Well, um, let's turn to 1 Peter, and I'll finish up there because it's real condensed. 1 Peter, uh, let's go to chapter 1. Peter, please explain, and you follow along just a moment in 1 Peter 1 and verse 3. Peter, explain to me what happens after we die. Is there anything to fear if we've been born again? Uh, is there some kind of place of fire to purge us, to kind of get us ready for heaven? You know, Is that something we should kind of, uh, kind of worry about that's going to be out there for us? 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has begotten us, we're born again, through the resurrection of the dead, of Jesus Christ from the dead, now look at this, unto a living hope, unto an incorruptible inheritance, undefiled, unfading, reserved in heaven for you, by the power of God, you are guarded through faith for salvation, which is ready to be revealed in the last time. Over this you rejoice. And that is what every Catholic Bible on the planet says. And that's exactly what we believe. We have a guarded destination. We have been promised by the Lord and his servant Peter that we have a living hope, not a dead end fire to get us ready for that living hope. Peter, continuing in uh, verse 23 of chapter 1, uh, how are we born again? Is it through baptism? Is it through a sacrament where, that we have to participate in, that we finally get to join God's family? Uh, what What is the means that we get this? Verse 23, for you have been reborn, the confraternity text says, not from corruptible seed, but from incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And isn't that what the rest of the scripture says? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why, how shall they hear unless they hear the word of God? And how will they hear unless there's a preacher? And how shall they believe unless they hear the word of God? The whole Romans 10 concept, Peter totally agrees with. It is not through the institution or through the instrumentality of the church. It's through an individual receiving as James calls it, the engrafted word, as Peter said, through the word of God which lives and abides forever. Look at verse 25. And Peter, I ask you another question. How important would you say the Holy Scriptures are, the Bible, to us as Christians? Uh, should we look on them as equal with tradition? Or wh where is the Bible fit? Verse 25. The word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. That's what's going to abide forever. The word of the Lord. Now look at chapter 2, verse 4. Peter, tell us what Jesus meant when he picked you. And he said you would build his church. Was it built on you? Do you or any of the apostles know what Jesus meant about that? I mean, that's the, the key rallying cry of the Roman church. Well, look at verse 4 of 1 Peter 2. And coming to him as living stones, Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. You know what the cornerstone is? What the building is built on. Did Peter think the church was built on him? No, never did. Never thought that. Uh, never taught that. Never let people believe that. He said, no, no, this church, 1 Peter 2, 4, is built on Jesus. By the way, Peter, does anybody else agree with you on that? Well, 1 Corinthians 3.11, if you want to see what Paul said, he said the same thing. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid. It's Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on anything else, his work won't abide. So I'm glad, Peter, you said that because the Apostle Paul agreed with that. 
uh, while you're in First Peter two nine, Peter, what are priests to do as they serve in Christ's church? I mean, there's a whole army of them now, and they said they're following your instructions in in this church that they say that you started. What are they supposed to do? Well, look at verse nine, because actually, uh, we have more priests here than you realize, right? We're all who are born again priests. And you should think about that as you prepare and as you come. Look what it says, what he says we should do in 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. But you yourselves are living stones, a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices. That's verse 15, back up. You're a chosen race, verse 9, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a purchased people, that you may proclaim the perfections of him who called you out of darkness. And so as priests, what should we do? We should be, verse 15 we should be offering spiritual sacrifices to God. Now look down at verse 21. Do we have to do any amount of good works to help balance out our account with God? Does that help us atone for our sins, Peter? Verse 21. Of First Peter 2, Christ has suffered for you. He bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live to justice. By his stripes we were healed, verse 24. So we can't add to it. Even our offering sacrifices doesn't add to it. It's his death. And finally, look at verse 18 of chapter 3. First Peter 3, 18 and through 22, a couple of ideas. Who can we count on to open the way to God for us? Does God listen to our prayers for salvation in need of grace, or does he listen to someone else? Peter, we really want to know. Verse 18 of 1 Peter 3. Christ also died once for sins. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. No priest, no sacrifice, no sacrament, no vicar, no mediator, No one can bring you and me to God, but the just one, verse 18 of chapter 3, who died for us unjust ones, whose job it is to bring us to God. And finally, verse 22, Peter, what's the best way for us to think about and commune with Jesus? Uh, What image should come to our minds? Should we think of Jesus as a baby in his mother's arms? Should we imagine him dead on the cross? What, What picture do you want to leave with us? Because we're so prone to thinking that. Well, look at verse 22 of 1 Peter 3. Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God, swallowing up death, that we might be made heirs of eternal life. For he went into heaven... Angels and powers and virtues being made subject unto him. And Peter, now that you're at the end of your life, do you think you're higher than any of the apostles? No. We already read chapter 5. I am your fellow elder, fellow shepherd. And Peter, since Christ spoke with you directly about his church right at the start, is there a vicar of Christ? Who is the true sovereign pontiff? Who will reward the faithful church leaders? As we read verse 4 of 1 Peter 5, And when the prince of the shepherds appears, you, the presbyters, from him will receive the unfading crown of glory. By the way, Peter, is everybody going to be saved eventually? I mean, do you think everybody's going to make it to heaven? He comments on that. Second Peter, if you want to turn over the page to Second Peter 3, this is what he says in verse 7. Will God eventually save everyone and allow them into heaven because he's so loving? Peter didn't think so. Second Peter 3, 7. But the heavens that now are and the earth by that same word have been stored up being reserved for fire against the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. Peter preached the same gospel that we believe and proclaim. Peter is my hero. Peter is one of the greatest humans who ever walked this planet. He showed us what God can do with a bully, what God can do with a failure, and what God can do with a success. Peter only needed to be around Jesus. Then he was a model of boldness, fearlessness, leadership, forgiveness, restoration, success, and humility. But Peter was not a pope while he lived, and he certainly 
should not be made one after he died. As he said, worship Jesus. And that's what we're going to do. Lord, we trust completely in the blood of Jesus Christ, your son. Because sinners who have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ have been set free from all unrighteousness, all condemnation. Because there's no condemnation to us who are in Christ. And so as those who have been liberated, those who have been freed, we come to offer a spiritual sacrifice to you. We clothe ourselves in the priestly clothes of humility. We ask for your cleansing that we might be pure and white before you. That your spirit be unhindered by any sin that would grieve or quench him. And then our spirits, may they rise mixed with our loving adoration to you as a spiritual sacrifice of praise to you. We give thanks. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.